Good morning once again from St. Peter's. We are finishing up our uh, section on salvation in the soil of Christianity is Judaism. And what we want to look at today are the last two elements of that topic. How salvation in the Old Testament relates to salvation in the New Testament. And once we do that, and we're going to hit a lot of scripture, so we're just going to shotgun through the scripture, because most of it is pretty clear. Then what we're going to do is we're going to address the question of the relationship between Abraham and Jesus and how that impacts our understanding of Israel and the church. All right? So, without further ado, Let's start with the first point. Salvation belongs to the Jews. And who has Genesis 15, 6? Nobody. <laughs> I'll take it to her. All right. Genesis 15, 6 is essentially the, uh, the covenant established with Abraham. But what we want to, what we want to note is what Yahweh says to Abraham. And he says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it, he, Yahweh, accounted it to Abraham for righteousness. So from the start, Abraham and his faith provide the foundation for everything that comes after in relationship to salvation. Okay? Who has Genesis 17, 5? I do. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Okay. Nations blame Gentiles. So it's not just the Jews. So the word that's used in the Hebrew is the word that's used for Gentiles. Gentile. Yes. That's why when we say that Abraham is the, uh, the uh, Jesus, the seed of Abraham, we see that those many nations come through Jesus. But they also came through Abraham. Remember, Abraham had, he was the father of Isaac and Ishmael, and through Ishmael we have what? All of the Arab nations, and etc. So, uh, did you figure out which one it was, Ross? <laughs> I think it's 12. 2112, okay. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Okay. Again. I see singular all right and we have to keep in mind that the concept of seed can be expansive okay so when we see it in relationship to the covenant which is what you're seeing right there in Genesis 21 12 where Yahweh is reconfirming to Abraham I know you're upset dude I know that you love your your eldest son Ishmael, but your seed's not going to come through him. Your seed is going to come through the younger. It's going to come through Isaac, and that's another pattern that you're going to notice. In the ancient Near Eastern world, the eldest was the one that had all of the familial rights. All, period, bar none. If if the rest of the family got anything, well done them. But it was always the elder. And when you look at scripture, God always uses the younger. He always uses the second. Very, very, in very few instances do you see him use the, the elder. As a matter of fact, one of the most prominent, one of the most prominent places where he uses the firstborn is Jesus. So, God's not limited or inhibited 
by ancient Near Eastern custom. And in many cases, he issues it because he saw it. Okay. Now, the key passage in all of this, who is John 4.22? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, JP. John 4.22. You worship, you know not what. We know what we, should, what we worship, for our salvation is of the Jews. Now, here's Jesus. He's talking to the Samaritan woman. They're having a conversation. What does the Samaritan woman do? We worship on this mountain. You worship on that mountain. Who's right? And what does Christ tell her? He doesn't even answer the question. And if you'll actually look at what Jesus does in all of his parables, in 90, 90 not all of them, but in 90% of, I said all, 90% of, of his interactions with people, what do you see him do? They will ask him a question, and he cuts past the question and goes right to the heart of the matter. Right? He tells, he tells the Samaritan woman, you don't even know what you worship. <laughs> he goes, he goes, we know what we worship. Now, what does he say? That she's ignorant of the fact that they worship at Mount Gerizim? No. What he's saying is, you worship nothing. <laughs> you don't even realize that you're not worshiping anything. But we know, because salvation is of the Jews. And here's an interesting thing that you should keep in mind, especially when we get to it in a, in a, in a couple of uh, chapters. The nature of the temple in Judaism is the defining element of their identity. And I'm going to repeat that because that's very critical. The temple itself defines the Jewish identity. There is almost nothing more important in the Jewish life, in Jewish worship, in Jewish society than the temple. Which is why there was so much consternation over anything that happened at the temple. Which is why you see Jesus cleansing the temple. Which is why you see certain people not allowed in the temple. Because the temple can't be defiled. Because if you defile the temple, you defile Judaism. You defile the nation. The temple and its import on Israel cannot be overstated. And next week, not next week, excuse me, when we get to the next chapter, I'm going to explain to you why the temple is designed the way it is. There is a reason that the temple is designed with the measurements that you see in the temple. So, when Jesus says, you don't even know what you're talking about, because salvation is from the Jews, it's because salvation comes to the temple. And who is the true temple? Jesus. So do you see why he says salvation is of the Jews? Because it's the temple. He is the true temple. Salvation is through him and him alone. Salvation is through him and him alone. Now, I don't say that to be redundant. I say that because when you consider what salvation is, it's Jewish. And Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. And if you're interested in it, I can give you some reference to that, but that's not directly related to what we're talking about today, right this, this moment. Okay. All right. We good with that? Who has Romans 4, 1 through 16? What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. But what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh in the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. 
even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believed, though they not be circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them, who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. But it is a faith that is might be by grace, to the end of the promise, might be sure of all the seed. Not only that, excuse me, not to that only, which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Saying what? Yeah. Anybody want to take a stab? That's a, this actually, this is a typical Apostle Paul sentence. That's actually one sentence. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is. It's one sentence. Um, this is a typical Apostle Paul sentence. I'm going to start with a concept, and I'm just going to write until I run out of quill. <laughs> but it's all one theme. And the theme... Faith, not circumcision. And whose faith? The believer, Abraham's faith in God, doesn't need circumcision to be granted salvation. And how does that relate to us? We need faith, not circumcision. We need Abraham's faith. Yes. That's what this passage is talking about. That's exactly what this passage is talking about. Paul goes a long way around the barn to basically tell us Abraham was justified by faith. He was justified before he was circumcised. Which means justification is open to you as a Gentile. But what happens? Abraham is justified by faith, and then God gives him the sign of faith, circumcision. That's the sign of faith. That's the gift that God gave the church in the Old Testament. He gave them the sign of faith in him. So when you see circumcision, it's not a mechanical act. I'm going to let you know a little secret. Everybody in the ancient near, well, not everybody. But the circumcision was not a specifically Hebrew practice. Number of, a number of tribes in the ancient Near East did that. But Yahweh took it and he made it specific to Israel and gave it a specific content. It was his gift to us. You do this and this demonstrates your faith in me. And I want, this is not on your list, but I'm going to read this to you anyway. This is Philippians 3. 1 through 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. Now what in the world could he possibly be talking about? Beware of the mutilation, for we are we for we, notice Paul's emphasis, for we are the circumcision who worship God 
in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. What is that reference from Philippians? Philippians 3, 1 through 3. And now, tying all of this together, who has Romans 9, 6 through 8? I guess I do. Rose, you got it? I do. Shoot. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for all, for not all Israelites truly belong to Israel, and not all of Abraham's children are his true descendants. But it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. This means who are the this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but as but the children of the promise are counted as descendants. Okay. Um, that word descendant is the word that we've been using throughout the whole discussion. Seed. And the reason I prefer seed to descendants is because descendants gives the impression that it's Ishmael that's included in that. It's like all of Abraham, but it's not, because the context makes it very clear. It is not his physical descendant. You see what Paul is st stating here very clearly? Not all Israel is Israel. Uh, not Only Israel the is real. Okay. Uh, so when you're talking about faith, you have to realize that the faith that we talk about, if we are biblically faithful and accurate, is the same faith that Abraham had. And that's why we can call ourselves adopted sons. Because it is through Abraham's seed that we receive the ability to exercise this same type of faith. And his seed is Christ. So we exercise that faith in Christ, which makes us the true Israel. So, no, we don't use Jewish theology. We're not of the Mosaic economy any longer. Everything that we do is interpreted through Christ, but we're still the seed of Abraham. And who has Hebrews 11 8? That's the last one. Uh, okay, I'll read it. Hebrews 11 8. And I'm reading from the New King James, the only inspired Bible. Uh, <laughs> joking, just joking. <laughs> By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go out to the place which we would receive, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise. This is verse 9. As in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose Builder and maker is God. By faith, Abraham obeyed. You get a message from God tomorrow, I want you to move. Pack up. Take a hike. I'm sending you to some place. No, I'm not telling you where you're going. I'm just sending you. Okay, show of hands. How many songs? How many's bet renting that U Haul? <laughs> this is what makes what Abraham did so significant. You want to know what faith is? There's your definition of true faith. There's your definition. Faith always has an object. Always. No matter what it is. When you walked in here this morning, you sat down in those chairs, did you? Obviously, right? Did you stop to think whether that chair would hold you? No, you had faith in that chair, right? You placed your faith in that object. Abraham placed his faith in God. Not having seen him, 
in his essence. He saw a theophany, but he did not see God. He heard the command of God, and that in and of itself is just amazing. Can you imagine having a conversation with God? This is this is what boggles my mind about. I'm sorry, I'm off on a tangent now, but this is what boggles my mind about Adam and Eve. To walk with God in the garden, to hear His voice in your ear, to hear it, to walk side by side with Him, and then do the exact opposite thing He told you not to do. Okay, so salvation is of the Jews. I think. We're clear on that, right? I don't need to give you the rest of the 472,000 verses that demonstrate that. All right. Now, remember, and and keep in mind, too, when we talk about Abraham and he he obeyed, he left. There's the Exodus motif, right? He's being called out of Ur of the Chaldees. And we talked about that. Ur was was an established, uh, a fairly... uh, well-developed community. So he tells Abraham, uh, Abraham, Yahweh tells Abraham, listen, I want you to leave Colonial Heights and go someplace that I'm not going to tell you until you're on the road. I want you to leave the comfort of where you are. Everything with which you are familiar. Everybody you know. I want you to leave it all behind and do what I tell you to do. Because i got a better place for you. And he believed him. And he trusted him. And watch Abraham's actions at every... Except when he lies to the Philistines about Sarah. But watch Abraham's actions in relationship to God. Every time God tells him to do something... Abraham obeys every time. Complete trust and confidence in God. Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And you see Abraham bartering with God. What if? What if? What if? And God says, fine, Abraham. Knowing full well what the answer is going to be. You show me ten, I won't destroy the place. We got seven. Close. But he did not resist. Take your only son, your firstborn. I want you to kill him. Not your firstborn, but take take your son. I want you to kill him. The one you love. The one closest to your heart. No questions asked. Now, we can get into all sorts of debates as to why he was so willing to do that. Probably because he understood that God was not indiscriminately going to take a life. And he had faith that God would provide, which he did. But he did it. And that was Abraham's life. It was a life of total trust and confidence in the object of his faith. And that was God. And he set the foundation for us. Okay, now, uh, I'm going to give you the references. I'll read, I'll read a couple, but I'm just going to give you the references, so get ready to write them, because I want to get to the question, okay? So the next point is salvation is of the Gentiles. Genesis 12, 3, and 22, 18. Psalm 27, 27, and Psalm 86, 9. We 
have five in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 2, which should kind of generally sound familiar, because that's the, uh, that's the passage in which we read every Christmas. Isaiah 42, 1, 49, 6, 59, 5, and 60, verse 3. Daniel 7, 14. Hosea 2, 23. The Italian prophet, Malachi 1, 11. <laughs> One eleven. One eleven. Bingo. L I'm sorry. I guess right. <laughs> what? Bingo. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Luke two thirty two. John ten sixteen. And I got a whole bunch from Acts. Acts ten forty five. 11, 1, 13, 48, 15, 7, 18, 6, and the last verse doesn't exist, so I don't know why it's even there. There are not 29 chapters in Acts. Uh, there's probably 28, 28, but we'll just leave that off. Romans 3, 29 through 30. 3 what? 29 and 30. Romans 9, 24. Romans 15, 9 and the passage we began with Galatians 3 14 through 16 say that again Galatians 3 14 through 16 thank you Ephesians 3 6 Revelation eleven fifteen and Revelation fifteen four. Now I'm not going to read the Genesis passages because we essentially covered for the most part what they're going to say. Let me read I want to read to you uh, a couple of passages. Psalm twenty seven twenty seven, which we just Mentioned. I'm sorry, it's Psalm 27, 2 through 7. My apologies. But I'm not going to read the whole thing. When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And skip him down. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle, and I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And I have no idea why I included that reference. It just sounded really nice. <laughs> let, me, let me go on and read. Let, me read. let the Isaiah passages will be more to the point. I apologize for that. I don't know how that got in there. So what happens when you do two things at once. Isaiah 42, 1. Uh, 
Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles will receive justice in both sense of that word. Justice in the sense of judgment and justice in the sense of being brought in through Christ. Which is what the rest of Isaiah 40 follows. Uh, Isaiah 40 and follows, he says. Isaiah 49, 6. Indeed, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved one of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Obviously, there it's a reference to Christ. And since I mentioned my favorite Italian prophet, I'm going to read from him. Malachi 1, 11. And I'll read one Old Testament, uh, New Testament reference from Acts. Malachi 1, 11. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name. And a pure offering from my name shall be great among the Gentiles, says the Lord of hosts. So the Gentiles, the Jews knew the Gentiles would be saved. Don't, don't ever mistake the idea that the Jews wanted no, or that the Jews had no idea that the Gentiles would, would be saved. The Jews thought the Gentiles were going to be saved. They knew the Gentiles were going to be saved. They saw it prophesied in, in Genesis, all the way in the Torah. They knew it. What they didn't know was that the Gentiles would be grafted into Israel and that the two would become one. That's what they didn't know. Uh, Acts 13, 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been ordained to eternal life, so, we see that salvation is of the Jews, right? And we know that it's going to come to the Gentiles. And we've already seen that it's going to come through Abraham, right? Because of Abraham's faith, right? And this is going to bring us to his seed. Because Jesus is the true Israel. He is the consummate Jew. He's the eschatological Jew, if you will, by faith. Not that the nation of Israel suddenly disappears, but he is the eschatological Jew. So, Chris, um, I was just sitting here, you're talking about this, that uh, Abraham is our father by faith, right? And, and it just occurred to me how many different ways we moderns use the term faith. Uh, sometimes we, when we say, uh, I'm in the faith, it means I, I agree with the, uh, the tenets of the faith, of, of the Christian faith. Like I, <laughs> I can say the Apostles' Creed and, and I, mentally I agree with it. Mm -hmm. Or the, uh, the, the, some other form of a creed or mm -hmm. uh, of the, the baptismal vows. I, I've taken the baptismal vow. I've taken the, the confirmational vows at Dundas. That's, that's the faith, the Christian faith. But the, what you're talking about, faith takes an object. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and when we talk about being faithful to something, uh, you keep on doing it, I guess, what, right? You've been faithful to a job, I get that. Yeah, you're, you, you're, using, you're using cognates of the term, which and that was one of the reasons that when I said mm -hmm. Abraham's faith, I described it as his confidence and trust in the object. Yes, right. Um, so it's there are many ways where we do what you've said. Right. There's many ways where we place our trust in propositions. Yes. There are many where we place our trust in people. 
Um, there are many different expressions of faith, but the only one that saves us is this one. Why can't we back that up and say through Noah? I mean, you don't get any more faith filled than making that ark and climb. I mean, well, why can't we back it up and say it through Shem? Yeah. Yeah. Why did we come down on Abraham? Okay. Um, because that's what God told us. <laughs> because because he, wanted, he wanted to use... Now, you're right, in a sense, that there's nothing wrong with what you said, because the concept, um, the concept that you're addressing is the concept of... Uh, I need is the concept of covenant. And that what you see is God throughout redemptive history establishing specific relationships at specific times with specific people in specific contexts. The covenant with Noah was what type of a covenant? Just generally speaking, what, what would you if you if you think about the interaction between God and Noah from chapter six, Genesis six through Genesis eight? What what would you well actually nine? What would you think is going on there? What does God tell Noah? This is a covenant of. A covenant's legal. Yeah. Understanding right. that both sides have something to do to fulfill. Okay, but in this case. The covenant um, emphasizes, you're right, but in this case, the Noahic covenant is emphasizing one specific aspect that God wants all of mankind to know. Let's go through what happened. What happened in, what happened in Genesis chapter 6? You suddenly have forgotten our... What happened to Noah? He built the boat. He built the ark. Why did... Noah build the ark. What happened? God told him. Why did God tell him to build the ark? Because he was going to destroy everybody. Everybody. Say it again. Say it again, he was Teresa. Going to destroy everything in the world by by flood. By a flood. Why then did God establish a no, uh, covenant with Noah after? To never flood the world. And what was the sign that He gave Rainbow. Noah? Rainbow. Rainbow. There's the covenant. The covenant that God promised Noah and all of mankind that no matter what happens, no matter what happens in the future, I'm not going to drown everybody anymore, ever again. So the covenant of the remnant. That's no, one way of looking at it. Certain. Sure. All right? But this covenant is a little different. All right? This covenant includes this covenant. But this covenant doesn't include this covenant. Because this, the Noahic covenant, doesn't include this covenant in the sense of salvation, in the sense of spiritual salvation. Physical salvation, yes, but not spiritual salvation. Okay? <clears throat> but you picked up on something that is uh, endemic in Scripture. God's covenantal relationship with man. And when we get to chapters 4 and 5, where we talk about the covenant generally and the covenant as it relates to baptism and the Eucharist, I'm going to give you a detailed explanation as to the type of covenant that we see in the Old Testament. Especially when we're dealing with the Mosaic economy. It's called the suzerain vassal treaty. You don't have to don't worry about it. No, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it when we get there. But that's what it's called. And you will see it. And I will show it to you. It's one of the oldest ancient Near Eastern treaty documents. Every, every ancient Near Eastern culture had a form of this type of treaty. And I will show it to you in the book of Deuteronomy. Because the book of Deuteronomy is written exactly like an ancient Near Eastern Caesarean Vassal Treaty, which goes to prove the authenticity 
of Deuteronomy. It was historically rooted in the time. God used what was available for his people. All right, so, we good? Mm-hmm. All right. We good? All right. So, Abraham's faith. He had total trust and confidence. He fulfills the Exodus motif. He leaves the world behind him. The fallen world, if you will. To go to a land promised to him by Yahweh. That faith becomes the stream throughout all of Scripture driving us to the one seed that eschatologically fulfills everything that Adam, uh, Adam, Abraham did when he left Ur of the Chaldees in his total confidence and obedience. And it completes itself in Christ so that every single one of us when we place our faith in Christ have the right we have the right to call ourselves sons of Abraham by faith okay now let's take that concept for just a second and apply it to these two concepts If, if, Gentile or Jew, if Gentile or Jew places their faith in Jesus, that makes them what? According to Romans, what does that make them? Romans 9. You guys need to drink more coffee. The true Israel. Right? Well, if it is only through Abraham's faith, only through Abraham's faith, that one can claim to be the true Israel, is there a distinction between this Israel and the church when it comes to salvation? When it, when it comes to being a son of God, is there a distinction between Israel and the church? The church is just the people. So no. no, there's no distinction. There's no distinction. Because this then, if you create this distinction, this then assumes that the physical nation of Israel is a son of God outside of Christ. And what do we know Scripture says about the name of Christ? There is no yes, there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. So this idea of Israel and the church being two separate entities where the church is called out, raptured, and then seven years go by, and then all of this, and then Jesus comes back, and all of a sudden the church comes out for its encore and starts sacrificing animals again in the presence of Christ where Romans tells us at the second coming sin is eliminated Romans read Romans 8 19 through the end of the chapter sins eliminated but according to these people Israel in that thousand year reign can sin, then what in the what what's our, what's anyone's hope? So no. There's no separation 
between Israel and the church. And let me give you one other thing. And there are two, and, uh, and this is something that I bet you very few of you have heard, and it's one of the most common, <laughs> it's one of the most common ideas in scholarship. Good or bad idea? Uh, it's, it's pretty much neutral. Okay. Okay. That looks familiar to anybody? Synagogue. It's the Hebrew, it's actually the Greek word, but it means synagogue, right? Ecclesia, from, no, actually here, the Greek prep, act out of or from, and the Greek, uh, makes it Greek and English, but call out, oh, to be called, to be called out of, synagogue, to gather together, let you in on a little secret, promise not to tell anybody else in the world, this is just between us in this room. <laughs> and you out there. <laughs> There's no difference between these two words. Zero. They were used interchangeably from the writing of the Septuagint before Christ to this day. It's only people that want to separate Israel and the church that make this term some sort of technical term. Now, I cite this in the book. You can check it in the footnote. When we, you'll get to it. We'll get to that point. But I cite the scholars that demonstrate this to be the case so that you can look it up yourself. Okay? So, does that answer your, your question, Diane, about how the Abraham and the two? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's it. Anybody have any questions? Go go back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, go back like that. Okay. No. Would you say Jesus is the eschatological Jew? Eschatological. Et okay. Yeah. I'm using Jew in I'm using Jew in the ethnic sense, not in the individual sense. Okay. So it's not as if he's the last one and there are no other Jews after him. What I mean by that is um, do you remember when Jesus met Nathaniel? And what was his comment about Nathaniel, babe? What did he say about Nathaniel? In him it, it, there is he is a Jew with that's it. Uh, with no, no uh, with yes, God. yes, he exactly. He no guile. No yeah. He is a Jew with no guile. That's the way I, I'm using the term as a representative of the class, not as an individual. Okay. So Jesus is basically saying now here's a representative of Judaism that has zero guile. Okay. Anything else? Going once? Yes. Your lips are moving, but nothing's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm working it. Uh, I'm okay. All right. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Something in uh, contrast. Um, what is it? Contract with covenant. What's the difference there? That's a really good question. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes we're walking around thinking we're in a contract of some sort with God. You know, if I don't perform my end of it, well, that actually would be a fairly accurate basic summation. If you'll remember, well, not even remember. In your Bibles, turn to Matthew. Chapter 1, verse 1. And, 
and I hope all of your Bibles have this because of the way it's a failed effort. Okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Or if you have a Bible that's a study Bible of some sort, flip the page to the uh, introduction. No, no, you're right there. That's it. That's right. What does it say at the top? For those of you that have it, what does it say? Uh, okay, that's that's the chapter. Um, do you have a, is that a study Bible, Rose, or just a? Uh, go back one page. The early church fathers were. Okay, you. Matthew. Okay, that's the, that's the that's a that's a. Oh, what does it say? Yeah, I think that's it. I think uh, just turn back. You just have it. What does it say? At the end of Malachi. Oh, she, oh okay. All right, Rose. Uh, uh, Diane is the one that's got it. Uh, so what is it? What does it say, Diane? The New Testament. The New Testament. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But the key is testament. Now. When we're thinking about that in terms of Jesus, testament, covenant, what, what, Sorry. Be glad I'm not preaching you with a bar from communion. Um, <laughs> so, what we're talking about is Jesus' last will and testament. And here's, a, here's something that I think I included in the book. I think I did. One of the elements of the ratification. I need a volunteer to read Genesis 15. I'll tell you the section in a minute, but I just need somebody want to read Gen? Okay, I'll read it. None of you guys volunteer, man. I got it. I was right. Okay. All right. All right, Carol. Good. I'll right. You still with Matthew. <laughs> um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I don't, yeah, go to uh, 15 8 until. The end of the chapter. And he said, Lord God, where shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, take me a heifer of three years old and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old. And the turtle dove and the young pigeon. Hang on for a second. I have my drawing one that I saw. Don't laugh. Oh yeah, I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you guys. It's not nice to hate you. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Okay. Well, it is. Oh. Now, <laughs> I think it's a heifer, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it may be a It may be a skip. It may be a skip. I'm not even getting paid for this. <laughs> okay, what was the next one? A heifer, a uh, she goat. No horn. No horn. No horn. Next. Right. <laughs> Put more on it. Turtle dove. Do not break out the song. I wasn't bad. All right. And a picture. You're like maybe you can see it up in your head, but you can't get it out of your arm. <laughs> you know, when I was young, I actually was a decent artist. Yeah, pigeon. Yeah, then, it, then my father beat it out of me. <laughs> okay, pigeon, finish reading. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of a great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nations whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. How was the Egyptian captivity, by the way? Go ahead. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between these pieces. And that same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Keep going or? Oh. No, that's good. Okay. Animals. Dissection, and then a smoking pot goes between the two. Every covenant made, every will, every testament has to be ratified. And only when, now keep this in mind, only when the testator the person initiating the testament dies is the testament the will fully activated right nobody goes to a hearing with the soon to be corpse <sighs> they go to a last will reading In the covenant that God makes with his people. doesn't say it here, but this is the symbol that you will see in Deuteronomy. I mean, I'm sorry, in Exodus, when God gives Moses the law. My people, I am making my covenant with you. If you violate my covenant this is what's going to happen to you however as the smoking pot goes between them if I violate my covenant this is what's going to happen to me God ratified the covenant he made with Abraham with a sacrifice the birds left with the sin. And if either party violates this agreement, this is the punishment that's going to happen to him because the smoking pot represented Yahweh. And we know this because of what followed Israel. Cloud. And fire. the pillar of fire and the cloud. <laughs> okay, so you, you see the foreshadowing? So this is what we're talking about when we talk about a covenantal relationship. There are stipulations. And as I said, once we get to once we get to that chapter in the book, and I lay this out for you in Deuteronomy, it's I, I think it'll give you an, an entirely new perspective on it how you look at, uh, especially the Old Testament, but your understanding of the covenant and what that means in relationship to Jesus. Remember what Jesus told his, remember what Jesus told the apostles? The apostles. Why did John's disciples etc. Yeah, why are they fasting? And we're not. And what did he say? Because when the bridegroom is here, 
is no reason, right? And what was he doing? He was telling them, the bridegroom is not going to be here. And how many times in Scripture do we see, how many times in the scripture do we see Jesus actually telling them, the Son of Man must, the Son of Man must, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, the Son of Man must suffer many things, the Son of Man kill this temple, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. This temple. The true temple. Right? Okay. Any other questions? One other question? I got something that I was thinking about this week and I want to share it with you. It's very brief. <laughs> um, okay. If I were to if I were to ask you, have you read this particular history of America? Doesn't matter what it is. And I tell you in that history, you're gonna read some fascinating things. And you come back to me and you tell me. Well, it's fun, it's nice, but it ended in, two, in the year 2000. How would you know that a history book dealing with the history of the United States, how would you be able to know that that history book ended in the year 2000? No mention of 9 11. No mention of 9/11. The most significant historical event of at least the last, what, 40 years, right? Okay. Okay, I can go back as far as you want. You can go with eight, but one of the most significant historical events. So we know that if you read that book, and it doesn't include the, the, uh, the, the destruction of the Twin Towers, we know it was written before 9-11. All right. So we can date that with almost what? Certainty. 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 All right. I'm going to give you a little history. I'm going to give you a little lesson in New Testament textual criticism. And when I'm done, I'm hoping you will appreciate the confidence that you can place in your New Testament. Book of Acts. What's the one thing in Jewish history that is not mentioned in the book of Acts? Destruction. Destruction of the temple. When was the temple destroyed? 70 AD. A.D. 70. How many Gospels mention the destruction of the temple? Nothing. How many books of the New Testament mention the destruction of the temple? I mean, mention that it has occurred. Starting to get the picture? What are the last 13 chapters of the book of Acts addressing? I'll give you a hint. One name. The Apostle Paul. When was the Apostle Paul executed by Nero? Alright. We know that Paul was imprisoned by Nero in early AD 60, we know that he was dead between 62 and 65 AD. So what can we conclude about the book of Acts? It was completed before 65 AD. What was written before the book of Acts?
because all scholars, all scholars, doesn't matter of what ilk, will tell you it's Luke Acts. It's a two volume. Well, if Acts was completed between 62 and 65 AD, and Luke was written before 62 AD, or between 62 and 60, how early is it? How early is Luke? At least 62 AD. Now take into consideration how long it took material to travel in the ancient Near East, in the ancient Near East. How long it took to write material in the ancient Near East. Now we are at least at 59 AD. At least, right? So Luke and Acts form. The final seawall. Well, we know that Luke quotes who? Mark and Matthew, right? Which means that Mark and Matthew, considering the things that we just discussed, time to write, dissemination for everybody, not just a handful of people, dissemination for everybody to get a copy. So we know that at least this is undisputable. Four Gospels were written. And that's why I mentioned how critical the temple is in the Jewish psyche and in the Jewish mindset. The four Gospels make no mention whatsoever of a prophecy that Jesus made. All were probably written between 55 and 65 AD. When was Jesus crucified? 25 years. Somebody wrote a history of the United States within the last 25 years. Would you consider that pretty reliable? Provided that there's no angle and. No. Yeah. Sure. John. I always thought I'd that John came. Everybody, everybody, everybody cites John as being written between 95 and 100 AD. The problem with that is if you read John, and this and, and this is why these these conversations have to be done objectively and fairly. Have you ever considered? Now, we've talked about this. Uh, let me take a half a step back. We talked about this in the very, in the very first lesson. Each of the gospel writers is writing a biography of Jesus from a different standpoint, right? I mean, how many, how many biographies of Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt have been written since the 1950s, right? A thousand? Does every single one of them have to say the same thing? If they do, why are we writing a thousand biographies, right? So they all have a... I'm now I'm speaking in tongues. They all have a specific <laughs> angle, right? All right. Read the Gospel of John. And what do you see John saying? What do you see him saying about Jesus? He is God before the foundation of the world. The Logos. He is the true line. Uh, he's, the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the Logos. He is... He is the true. He's the living. He's the living bread. He's the light. He's the good shepherd. He's the ark. He's the temple. When you look at the Gospel of John, what you see is John is mirroring the tabernacle, and hence the temple. Why would he write about the temple and not mention the destruction of the temple? And again, you have to keep in mind, 
Jewish psyche is wrapped up in the temple. Their identity is in the temple. To not mention the destruction of the temple. We can't, we can't go a day today without talking about 9-11 in some sense or another. Whether it's the war, and whether it's the GWAT or whatever it is. We've been at war for 23 years. The Romans walking through, sacrificing on the altar. Vespasian turning over the destruction of the temple to his son Titus. And Titus ransacking and taking everything that they had, the money, whatever, whatever items they had. We know that the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there, but everything else. And John wouldn't mention it. Very implausible. Very implausible. I'll tell you another thing. Anybody hear of John A.T. Robinson? John A.T. John J. A. T. Robinson Robinson was a heretic. He was well, not a heretic. He was an unbeliever. Last 1800s, early 1900s. No one was actually later than that. In the 1900s. Didn't believe the Gospels. Rejected them outright. Just rejected them. Decided that he is going, and he was, uh, I believe he was an Oxford don. He was going to refute the New Testament. He did a study many, many, many years. Came back, wrote a book called Redating the New Testament. And he concluded that every book in the New Testament was written before 70 AD. And became a Christian. W.F. Albright, the dean of archaeologists, used to teach at Johns Hopkins, made the statement the New Testament was written by Orthodox Jews in Palestine prior to 70 AD. There is no historian of antiquity, none, that would question Caesar's commentary on the war in Gaul, or the Gallic Wars. Now one, there is no historian of antiquity that would question the writings of Herodotus, Xenophanes, Titus, not that plenty. Never. Wouldn't question it. These texts were written between 300 BC and 180. The original documents. The average length of time between the original documents and the first copy 900 years and not one scholar of antiquity would question the reliability of those documents I just showed you that we've got at least one document within 25 years of the death of Christ. I knew one historian that basically said, you show me a document that was written even 70 years after the death of Christ. And I'll show you a document that for all intents and purposes still had wet ink. That's how they viewed it. That's how they would view it. I never questioned the trustworthiness of your New Testament. And remember this. Your New Testament quotes the Old Testament. And Jesus is also the quoting. So your confidence in your Bible should stand. Okay? Uh, any other we can we can ask questions, we can whatever you want, or we can stop and you guys can run away. We good? <laughs> How did all of the um, 
the writing that I read about the hundred, of John being written at 90 or 100, yeah. how did that come about? Just because he lived so long, they thought he wrote it at the end, or where did that come from? Well, it comes from, it, it comes from German higher criticism is where it comes from. It comes from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, where, simply put, you know how we talk about antiquity and modernism and postmodernism? Well, in the modern period, what winds up happening is we start to see the development of science whatever that means, but we start to see the development of science. And we start to see a movement away from conceptual authoritarian statements. Because we start moving towards this concept of pure empiricism being the only way that we can have any truthful knowledge, right? So, what can be verified about the New Testament empirically. Essentially, for the most part, the documents, right? That's probably, I mean, we can't, we can't empirically verify that Peter cut somebody's ear off. So it's a historical evaluation, and that's the first problem. They try to apply a scientific methodology, or the scientific methodology at the time, to historical documents. I'll give you an example. Scientifically proved to me, right now, scientifically proved to me that George Washington was the first president of the United States. I'll wait. The Constitution or the Articles? Scientifically proven that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Scientifically. Observe, hypothesize, falsify, repeat. Good luck with that. That's historical validation and historical verification. But because they're in an age of the wonders of science, science became the determining factor, and they were being gracious. They're being gracious, saying 95 AD. I know liberal scholars that say the, the Gospels, all of them, were written in the 200s. So, anything else? We can stop now, and if you want to chat at lunch, we can chat at lunch, too. Okay? Because I know my sweetie has an appointment, so... Okay, um, we're not going to meet next week for Ash Wednesday. We will then pick up again on the blah, 22nd. And the 22nd, we'll start with the rule of God, and then we'll do that in three lessons. We'll do the rule of God, the holiness of God, and then the question, is the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament?